Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise in this house today. He's worthy, amen? Welcome today. My name is Jeff. If you're a guest for the first time, I'm the lead pastor here at the church, and I get the awesome privilege of bringing the message to you guys today, so I'm so excited about that. Please get your Bible apps open. We're going to go into the Word of God today. We're also going to put it on the screen for you to follow, but if you would like the notes of today's service, and for those online, you can do the same. Go to our church app, and there we always have the Sunday morning notes that are available to you so that you can follow along. And we have places where you fill in areas as well. It's kind of interactive, and I love being able to do that. I want to start off by uh, just saying when I was 14 years of age, my, my dad said, hey, we're going to go for, uh, on vacation to Florida for two weeks. So me, my sister, and of course, my parents, we drove all the way from Western Maryland all the way to Florida. And so the goal was that we were going to hit every theme park from Orlando to Tampa. And we did. We went to Busch Gardens. We went to Disney World. We went to several different places. But I also remember going to Cypress Gardens here on Cypress Gardens Boulevard. And I remember driving up and my dad just said, you know, this would be a great place to live, wouldn't it? Had no idea I'd end up pastoring just two miles away. Come on, that it's absolutely amazing what the Lord has done. It's just incredible. But I remember we wanted to go to the beach, and we were going to spend the entire day at the beach. And so my mother said, listen, you know, we're from Maryland. We have lily white skin. We've not been out in the sun much. You need to put sunscreen on because the sun can be pretty hot here. And so we got to the beach, and I'm 14, and I'm just like, I'm not putting that stuff on, you know, because back then it was different than it is now, you know. It was only two years ago. But anyways, it was uh, just different, and I didn't want to put that on. And so we spent the entire day at Cocoa Beach. I'll never forget that. Went to Ron John's surf shop, spend all kind of money on the long sleeve T-shirts, all that kind of stuff. But that night, I was paying the price. I mean, they were putting vinegar on me. I was crying. I was in pain. And we lost two days of our vacation because I just didn't listen to what my mother told me to do. Come on. How many of you know what it is to get sunburned sometimes, especially in that hot July sun? I want to show you some pictures of some folks that forgot to put sunscreen on, and as a result, they really got burned. I think they're going to come up in a minute. Boom. There's one. Look at that. Can you imagine getting burnt like that? I love this next one because this is really the funny one to me because this has happened to me before where I left my sandals on while I'm fishing on the boat, you know, that kind of a thing. But here's the other one that's really, really funny. During the pandemic, you know, these are the kinds of things. (laughs) That's probably a little Photoshop, you think? (laughs) But anyways, we all know that this is when we get burnt, we experience a lot of pain and a lot of hurt. Today, That was funny, but I'm going to be talking about the purpose of pain today. I really want to hit this subject. You know, probably one of the most defeating statements that I hear as a pastor is the statement that sounds something like this, I just don't see the purpose. And people a lot of times will say, I don't see the purpose of staying in this marriage. I don't see the purpose of giving 10% of my income to the Lord. I don't see the purpose of even coming to church so regularly like everybody else does. And uh, a lot of times people say that it's very painful. What's the point? You know, why do I need to even do this? Now, how many of you uh, would say that you don't like pain? (laughs) Would you raise your hand if you don't like pain? Well, I would argue with you today that it's not that people don't like pain. They just don't like pain without a purpose. You know, when someone gets in a car wreck and it hurts somebody, we think, man, what, what, what's that all about? Or someone gets cancer, and, and, and all of a sudden, it's basically a death sentence. And we think, what in the world is that all about? Where was God? This was a good person. They, they prayed. They gave their time. They, they loved different people. I just don't feel like it's fair. In other words, people hate pain without a purpose. Are you with me on this? In other words, there's no payout. You know, I have a a friend and uh, several friends actually through the years that would pay money to run in a marathon. Can you even imagine that? I, I know what it is to run three miles, and it seems like everything in your body is hurting. You know what I'm talking about? But here they pay to not only run five miles or 10 miles, but 26 miles 
It's kind of an amazing thing. And the reason that they love doing it is that they say the satisfaction that you get after you've completed something like that was worth it. And I'm thinking to myself, really? (laughs) But I think about childbirth. Now, I'm not, I am incapable of having a child. And the mother of my children, do you notice what I just did there? Anybody have an idea? I'm not going to call her the birthing parent. I'm going to call her the mother of the child. Some of you will get it later as you're going home. And so I was there when all three of our children were born. My wife, she made the decision that she was going to have natural childbirth. We didn't go to the hospital. She didn't have an epidural, any pain medication. She wanted to do that. I thought she was crazy. My family thought she was crazy. But, and I didn't pass out on any of the situations, by the way. Praise God, I was right there. On one incident, I do remember I had a lifesaver in my mouth, and I was up in her face going, breathe, breathe. And the the breath I had and the lifesaver together, finally she looked at me and said, get out of my face. So the pain can do funny things to you, if you know what I'm talking about. But think about this. The pain had purpose. And when the baby came, come on, when the baby came and she held the baby, it was like nothing at all. And we were talking about this the other day, and she said, listen, if I could do it all over again, I would do it again because of the preciousness that was there. I endured that pain. I think about a person that spent their life being a drug addict, or they really got hooked on drinking, and as a result, it's torn their life up, but they decide to get sober. And, and, and getting sober means that sometimes you have to suffer and go through a lot of pain. But I love it when they're able to say to us, hey, I'm two years clean. I'm three years clean. I'm four years clean. And they'll tell you it was painful, but it had a purpose because now I feel so free in my life. Are you with me on all of this? We don't mind the pain as long as we know that something good is going to come from that pain. And so I got thinking about all of this as I share today about the purpose of pain and talking about hurting and things that are going on on the inside of us. And I thought of a story that is found in Luke chapter 22. If you don't mind, let's read it together, starting with verse 31. It says here that Jesus is having a conversation with Peter. Remember Peter the bold, the brash, one of the disciples. And he says, Simon, Simon, Satan... Listen to this. Satan has asked. Everybody say asked. I want you to see that in Scripture. He has asked to sift all of you as wheat. King James says to sift you as wheat, Peter. But I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith would not fail. Now, this is an interesting story when you look at this. Because the bottom line is the devil comes to Jesus or has a conversation with God. God relates it to Jesus and says, listen, Peter, Satan has asked for permission to come against you, to attack you, to inflict you with some kind of pain. Now, that can throw our theology into a tailspin sometimes. And I really want you to know something right here, that God is a good God, and God doesn't have pain to hand out to you. Come on now. But he'll use the pain of this life and the pain that the enemy inflicts because he is the thief who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. To your advantage, it has a purpose to bring about the plan of God for your life. So now that I have your attention, I want you to think about this. Because sometimes, think about how God, in his preparation for your life, will package it with a form of pain to teach you some things, to understand some things, to get a hold of some character issues that if you don't, you can't step over into the fullness of what God has for you. We pick back up in this story and we go down to verse 61 here and it says, the Lord turned straight at Peter or turned to look at Peter basically. And it says, then Peter remembered the word that the Lord had spoken to him. Now, let me just set this up while this is on the screen. So Jesus is being beaten and all these things are happening before he goes to the cross. And so Peter had, Jesus had told him, you're going to deny me three times. And, and then Peter did deny Jesus three times. And on the third time, Peter looked up and he caught eyes. He was in the presence of Jesus. He caught eyes with Jesus. Could you imagine how he felt when that took place? 
And the Bible says that he remembered what the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows. Today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. Peter knew this had happened. Now, Peter's life, you got to understand some things about Peter's life that's kind of interesting. It goes back to Matthew chapter 16. And we see that Jesus is talking to the disciples and he's predicting his death. He's saying, this is the plan and the purpose of my life. In the process of him saying, I'm going to lose my life so that I can give life, we find that Peter basically says, no, Lord, this is not going to happen to you. I'm not going to let this happen to you. So Peter tries to stand in the way of God's plan for Jesus' life. And the response of Jesus was, Peter, you're being a stumbling block. Get behind me, Satan. Could you imagine, here is this choice disciple, this is the one that's going to be the leader, and he's basically called Satan. Peter had to learn some things the hard way, humility. He had to get rid of pride that was in his life. He had to learn how to serve. He had to learn some principal things in order for the power of God to really flow so that things would not go to his head. Jesus even predicted his death. We also find that when they were in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said, Peter, James, and John, go with me because I need to pray. I'm under great agony here because of what I need to do. Would you please watch and pray with me for one hour? And so he goes off and he prays and he comes back and he finds that Peter, the Bible says he found Peter asleep. And he said, Peter, could you not just watch one hour with me? So many times in our lives, We just don't seem to have the fortitude and the understanding and the willpower to press through some of the stuff that we're going through. And Jesus was trying to teach him a lesson that we've got to stay diligent. Come on. We've got to stay uh, to a place where we're vigilant, uh, uh, aware of the surroundings and the things that are happening. And then Jesus is arrested. And we find that that whole story is that Peter, out of fear, misunderstanding and not knowing what was happening in his life cuts the ear off the arresting soldier. Now, this is a funny story to me. You say, I don't know how that's funny. Somebody's ear got cut off because Jesus basically healed the ear. So that meant he had to say, find the ear. I mean, somebody had to search and find the ear. You know, they, did, they had to find it quick. Couldn't put it in a, in a, in a, in a Ziploc bag with ice. I mean, they, and Jesus put it back and he healed the ear of that man. But again, Peter was operating in the wrong spirit. Peter wasn't operating in the love of God. Sometimes we have to learn the love of God. And then the hallmark time was when he denied the Lord Jesus Christ. But I like something that James tells us, because when I think about pain, we've got to see pain through the perspective of purpose. If we're not careful as Christians and believers, we'll look at our life through the perspective of pain. And then we're always down and we're always upset and we never have joy and we never have peace. But if we understand there is purpose, come on now, that even what the church has been through and the, and the, the pandemic and all of those things, and we think it's awful and we think about what's happening in Washington, D.C., and we think about all the different decisions and all of that that's just awful, awful, awful. The truth of the matter is God is bringing the body of Christ together. He is masking an army for the last days. There is, come on, purpose in the midst of the pain. And we've got to see it that way in light of what the Word of God teaches us. That's why James put it this way in James 1, verses 2 through 4. I'll just read it to you. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. He wasn't talking to the world. He's talking to the church that's here. He says, whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be be mature, complete. And I love this next part, lacking nothing. I just feel like that I want to enter into what God has for our church in these last days. Come on, lacking nothing. And the only way we can lack nothing is if we learn perseverance and let perseverance create and bring about a maturity in our lives. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Come on, somebody say amen. We can't be divided about everything. We got to come together for the purpose of God moving by his spirit. So Peter denies Jesus. And the Bible tells us here in Luke 22, verse 32, 
that Jesus said, I prayed for you. I'm thinking, prayed for me? You're telling me I'm going to be attacked? You've given permission for me to be humiliated and shamed and all these different things. Why couldn't you just kick the devil out? But he says to him, he says that your faith would not fail. Notice the next part. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Did you catch that? See, sometimes we're out, we're doing our own thing, but it's there that the Holy Spirit speaks to us. It's when we're in the midst of the pain and we feel the loneliest and when we feel the hurt of what has taken place, the loss that has occurred in our lives, that's when God can speak and bring direction into our life. As a matter of fact, Psalm 34 verse 18 says that God is close. Think about this. He's close to the brokenhearted. Some of the greatest times of where God spoke to me have been when I was suffering the most in my life, whether it was an emotional suffering or a situation that was occurring that was bringing me uh, a lot of strain and stress in my life, that that's when I heard the voice of Almighty God. This church exists today because I was in a time where I was about to quit. I was in a time where we were getting ready to make a transition to do something different. But the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. I cried out to God. I'll never forget it. This church wasn't built yet. There was a, a tree about where my wife is sitting, where you all are right there. It was a big oak tree, and I had gone under that oak tree, and I began to cry out to God. This whole area was all, had a bunch of trees and a lot of things, you know. I began to cry out to God. I said, I don't know what to do. I don't know what, what's next. I can't handle this situation. And I heard the voice of the Lord speaking, and here we are today. And I could go back through my life at different seasons and different times. And it was in the time of pain, you understand, and not understanding why I felt the way I felt or why I was going through what I was going through that I realized that he was close to me. Not only does the Bible say that he is close to the brokenhearted, but he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Think about that for a second. Sounds to me like another story in the Bible of someone that had a lot of pain and had to understand the purpose of God, and that's the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah was a godly man pretty much all of his life, but in his 50s, he saw that the kingdom under King Uzziah was, something was wrong. Uzziah had disobeyed a command of God. He was a good king for many years, and the kingdom, the nation began to prosper under him, but he disobeyed God, and the hand of the Lord lifted off of his leadership. And Isaiah felt that and was concerned about that. Then all of a sudden, Isaiah, because he was inflicted with leprosy, he dies. His son had been reigning, even though he was alive, living in a separate palace. His son was reigning, but things were not right. And it threw the prophet of God into a state of depression. We pick up here in Isaiah chapter 6, and it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on the throne in his train. Listen to this. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above him was a seraphim, and they were calling to one, seraphims, and they were calling to one another, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with your glory or full of your glory. You think everything is going to hell in a handbasket. You think everything is falling apart, but the whole earth is filled with your glory. <laughs> At the sound of their voices, the Bible says the doorpost and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke, which would be the, the tangible glory of God that was seen that would look like smoke among the people. An amazing story. You know, I really believe sometimes if we don't have pain in our lives, we're not going to gain anything. We're not going to grow. We're not going to really get to that next place that we need to go to. Here's the point that I want to make. You know, when something happens to you and you're going through something that you don't feel like you can make sense, that's when God wants to reveal himself to you. And that's why we have to understand the, or have the right perspective and understand what the word of God is declaring so that we don't run from God, that we learn to run to God. 
And so here's Isaiah in the presence of God, and he sees into the realm of the Spirit, and the Bible picks up in verse 5, and he says, Whoa! Woe to me. He says, I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips living among people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. What I see out of that verse of scripture is God is close to you, but when you get into the presence of God, come on now, this is important. When you see God clearly, you're also going to see yourself clearly. And that's the part sometimes where we stop, or that's the place where we stop, because we don't know what to do. And that's where repentance comes in. That's where we have to trust that God has a plan. That's where we have to believe that something is bigger than ourselves. It's not condemnation. Listen, condemnation is really uh, something that shames us for what we've done. God does not shame us for what we've done. But conviction, which is totally different than condemnation, think about this, is really God showing us how we can change in our lives. We come to a church service and the presence of God is thick and it's strong. And all of a sudden we start feeling convicted in something in our heart. God is saying, I'm about to reveal how you can change. I'm showing you how you can get through. Oh, come on now. How you can get past so that you can say, this no longer plagues my life. This is not something that is hanging around anymore. Peter knew the word. Peter had a revelation and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And yet it's Peter that Jesus said, Satan, get behind me. You can have revelation. You can grow some, but God wants you to move on all the way. He doesn't want you just hanging around in one area saying, I think I'm good. I'm all right. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. How many of you ever said that? I'm good. I'm good. How are you really doing? I'm good. I'm good. That's why we love connect groups. That's why our small group ministry is so powerful because it takes about six weeks of people saying I'm good before they begin to break down. I remember the uh, first connect group that I did and um, we went around the room. How are you doing? What's your name? Get to know each other. Oh, man, everybody's just positive, excited. The next week, positive, excited. The next week, something changes a little bit. About fourth, fifth week, the next thing you know, people start getting raw and they start getting real. But by the end of that small group semester, you find those men bonded with each other, texting each other. Come on now, patting each other, praying for each other, encouraging each other being accountable to each other because they're talking about things that they struggle with and things that they go through. If you want to be a connect group leader, I'm telling you, we want you to be one, but we want you to go through next steps. And then you've got leadership training. And listen, by July the 17th, you've got to turn in what your connect group is going to be about. So we need you to do this because it's all about helping people to understand that pain has a purpose. Look at somebody and say, I believe that he's talking to, no, nah, don't say that. <laughs> There's a story in the Bible about a man by the name of Joseph. So we've talked about Peter, we talked about Isaiah, but we think about Joseph for an example. And the Bible tells us here that he went through a lot. He needed to learn some humility. He needed to learn how to serve. He needed to learn how to forgive. He was a favorite son. He was a privileged son. He had to go through some things. He ended up being sold into slavery by his own family. He's then taken into Potiphar's house, who he served faithfully with integrity, and he is accused of a wrongdoing. And Potiphar doesn't believe him, but has him thrown into jail. There's a person that's in jail that makes him a promise that would have gotten him out of jail, but the man forgot about him and left him there for seven years. He could have been bitter. He could have quit. He could have gone a different route, but God began to show him some things and teach him some things. And one day he had an opportunity. It only takes one opportunity. Come on now. He has an audience before the king and he interprets a dream. It's so accurate and so right on, and I believe the presence of God was there that in the process of time, he's elevated to second in command of a nation. One day, his brothers are standing before him. The whole story unfolds where they realize that it's Joseph whom they got rid of, and Joseph had the power to take their lives. 
he wept and he came back and he made this statement in Genesis 50, which is so powerful. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for, listen to this, for good that he brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people, including yours. See, when Isaiah got into the presence of God, the Bible tells us that an angel of the Lord, because he saw his sin, he saw what was going on, took a coal from the altar and touched the lips of the prophet Isaiah. It's right here in Isaiah 6, 6. And he said that he heard a voice, the voice of the Lord saying, who shall I send? In other words, once he received redemption in his life, Boldness came into his life that he wanted to do what God called him to do. And when the angel touched his lips, which is a type, come on now, of what Jesus did at Calvary to redeem us from our sins, hallelujah, he said, I'll go. In other words, I will answer the call to fulfill what God has called me to do. He was depressed. He was in pain. But he got into the presence of God and he received a touch from God and something began to change in his life. Joseph had to learn some things. Peter, come on now, somebody say amen to this. He had to learn some things. Here's a scripture that I love in Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things, everybody say all things, that God causes everything to work together for the good to those who what? Who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Now, things don't work for the good unless you love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. It's all about commitment. It's all about faithfulness. It's all about being strong in the things of God. But you have a promise that all things work together for the good, even when I don't understand the pain. Somebody walked out of my life. I don't understand that. You have no idea, Pastor Jeff. You've never been, you have no idea what I've been through. I have no idea what you've been through. But sometimes where we don't think someone can relate, they can relate. I've just learned I'm not going to be a victim. Because when you're a victim, you turn into a villain. But God doesn't want us to be a victim, nor does he want us to be a villain, but he wants us to be a hero. And once you're a hero, then you become the guide. Come on now, hallelujah, to help other people through the difficulties. Just like Peter, when Jesus said, I prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And when you return, strengthen your brothers. God has a purpose for the pain. You say, well, what are you talking about? The pain that is in your life can become a jail that imprisons you, or you can view it as a school that empowers you. I look back over my life, and I see the things that I've been through and the things that I've dealt with, and in reality, as I've left them in the past, they helped me to be who I am today. We all have that in our lives. You say, well, what do I do? How do I take care of these things? How do I handle these things? The purpose of pain, what do I do? I think the first thing is stop running from God. Run to God. Stop running from God, but run to God. I'm gonna have our team come back to the platform right now. Stop running from him. The Bible tells us, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him. While he is near, he's in this place right now. He's here in this service right now. He wants to touch your life. So don't run from God. Learn to run to God. But I've also learned this. We've got to learn to take steps to grow. Don't just come to church and think everything's going to be all right. Everything we do in this church is very purposeful for the reasons of wanting you to grow in the things of God. Peter, he put it this way, as a newborn babe, desire the sincere milk of God's word that you may grow. In other words, that you may grow into the full experience of salvation. He says, cry out for nourishment and taste and see the kindness of God. 
Sometimes we go away from church and we think, I didn't get anything out of that. It's what we put into it. I know I'm putting everything I got into it. But we've got to, by faith, reach out for it. So don't run from God. Run to God. Take those steps to grow. And then allow, once that happens, allow God to use you. In other words, allow God to use what you've been through to help somebody else. There are people that need to say, you can get through to the other side. Barbara Bonds is a great example of that. She lost her best friend in the world to COVID. He was a friend of mine. We know where he is. We rejoice with that. It's hard. No matter how, how, how you put it, it's hard. But she... I I believe she's the picture of this. She allowed God to use what she was through to help others. And you just don't know how many people have come and said, I I had lost my husband many years ago and couldn't get through it. Here she's only lost her husband over just a little over a year. And she helped me to get through this hard time in my life. Why? Because you can either let it imprison you, as I said earlier, or it becomes something that empowers you because he's close to the brokenhearted you've lost jobs situations people have said things people have done things to us sometimes we carry the pain of the sin of someone else we feel that and we carry that on the inside but yet we shouldn't carry it because the bible says that we're to be carriers of his presence and if the presence of God is full on the inside you know what and the more you put the presence on the inside the more it pushes out you can take a container that has contaminant in it and you can put a little bit of water in it and you can shake it try to get it out a little bit of water shake and get it out but what you can do is just let the water continually run and it has a way of bringing it out and it just goes out to where it's just the water See, sometimes we've got to let God work in us before he can work through us. Come on. See, I, sometimes it's a cliche to you. You hear me say to you, you lost somebody, you know, you just, you think of people during COVID. We lost a lot of different people. And I'd say, listen, they're in heaven to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Well, that doesn't help me. Well, I'm sorry it doesn't help you, but it helps me because you know what? I will see them again. My salvation is sure. I knew that they were. I felt the peace of God, so I'll see them again. This is a a short stint. In other words, I can't let this life be a prison. I've got to do what God's called me to do. We can't let this life be a prison. Don't be a prisoner to the past. Come on now. Don't be a prisoner to someone else and what they did to you. That's why the Bible says forgive. Jesus hanging on the cross. Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. He didn't let it get to him. Come on, glory to God. And we got to rise up. Let's stand to our feet. Don't leave. I finished early. We're getting ready to go into a worship song. And I feel the presence of God on this platform today. He's in this house. I know how he's dealt with me today and what to do. If you've got pain in your life, You've got things that you need to surrender to God. You just know some things are holding you back. You don't know why, whatever it is. We're going to start a song. And as we sing this song, I want you to come to the front. Where God has met me the most is at the altar. Come on now. That's where I've heard the voice many times is at the altar of God. And I just felt like the Lord wanted us to do this today. But we need to all participate in this service. This is a big crowd. We need to worship God. But if you've got something you need to give to God, you come down here as we begin to worship. And I'm going to pray. I won't embarrass you. I'm just going to pray over you. And we're going to see God. God do some incredible things. So let's lift our hands up. Come on now. Father, begin to move in this house right now. Begin to do something in this place in the name of Jesus.
woman right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. We bless your name, oh God. We cry out to you. Jesus, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we give you power in your name. You fill us with your joy. Oh, Lord, in this house, Lord. Oh, bless your people, I pray. Yeah. Father, every man, every woman that has come forward here, Lord God, and they're going through something right now, I pray that there is a sense of release in the name of Jesus because they took that step of faith. Let them leave here today with joy. Hallelujah. Let them know that you are close, that you want to speak to them, and you want to direct them and to help them. Touch them today. Touch everyone in this house today. Thank you for being here today and speaking to our heart, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> oh, God's good. God's so good. Woo, I'm sweating bullets up here. It's hot in this house. We got to get the air down a little bit more. It's hot. Hallelujah. Many, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. So that you can talk to people, to women that are young. See, I've been here. I know what this feels like. And I also know how to get through it. And help them. Help them. Glory be to God. Don't let the enemy imprison you. But come on now, you're empowered by the Holy Spirit to touch other people for his presence and his glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for coming down and being bold today. Amen. I appreciate that. You may go back to your seats. Whew. Always remember after every service, there's communion. We've got crosses where we encourage you to write things and put them there as an act of faith. We have a prayer team that's going to be down front today that if you need extra prayer for something going on or you're ready to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, they would love to lead you in the sinner's prayer to rededicate your life as well. So don't be shy to do that. And they'll direct you and they'll help you in those areas. So you'll see them. They're coming down. They'll be stationed here at the altar at the front of the stage. Man, I'm glad I came to church today. I just feel something on me. I just... We got one more service, so pray for me. Come on, somebody say, I'll pray for you. Uh, three or four of you, amen. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, but I got one more service to do today, and I, I really want to do well because I want the presence of God to touch people's lives, amen. So remember, these people are here to pray with you, to receive Christ, that you can rededicate your life to the Lord. We love you guys. Be blessed to the Lord. Come on now, put your sunscreen on. Have a good week in Jesus' name. Amen.